Welcome everyone to the Fail Fast Podcast. I am Quinn Amorm and today with us I have a guest who's a best-selling author with 11 books specializing in psychological approaches to leadership. He's also one of the top 10 thought leaders in the world for organizational culture and leadership. He's the founder of the Directive Communication Psychology, a TEDx speaker, He's the co-founder of the Kingsley Leadership Academy. With us today, Arthur Carmarzi. How are you? Hi, Quinn. I am awesome. Thanks so much for having me on the cat on the podcast. Uh, thank you for being here. It's a fantastic. Super excited to have you here. Ah, likewise. So I have a just to start off right off the bat. Uh, you know, your best-selling author. You have eleven books, which is extraordinary. You founded several businesses, organizations, but I know it's not all easy. Uh, you've been in half a million in debt. Yeah, huh? I, 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 and that really sucks. Do not try this at home. It's huh? uh, yeah, it was you know you you, you know when I was um, the whole half a million dollar in debt thing. You know why I was a half a million dollars in debt? Because of my ego. Okay. Tell me more so, about that. All right. So let me, let me kind of give you the, you know, the, the whole background, uh, you know, behind this. See, you know, at, at one point, um, I managed to convince this company to uh, open an office in Korea. Okay. Now, the reason that I wanted to go to Korea was because I had met this girl. And so I needed to find a way to get to Korea and, and, and actually have a job, right? So I managed to, uh, to convince this company to open a branch in Korea. So I was the managing director of this company. And the purpose of this company was to create franchises um, for uh, different uh, manufacturers so that they could essentially have their, um, uh, their ability, their, the, the, the things that they're producing turned into a franchise. Okay, so that way they'd make a much higher profit margin, plus, of course, sell the franchises themselves on the stuff they're making. So anyway, um, it turns out that I was really good at this job, and it was much more of a hands-on kind of thing. And um, so I thought, wow, you know, like my shit don't stink. Sorry, can I say that? Okay. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so so yeah, because, because I, I became so successful at that, Everything that we worked on was successful. So, I, you know, I, I st my head started to get really, really big. And I thought, well, damn, I'm doing this for these other guys. So I, I should be able to do this for myself. So I had this one idea and I thought, hey, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to bring my own, this, this franchise that I made for other people. I'm going to create one for myself and I'm going to put it and I'm going to do this one in Singapore. Because this one uh, at the time was in Korea when I was doing all these different things. And so I thought, hey, okay, so now... Um, the, uh, the, the, I, I take all my money and I borrow another half a million dollars to build this whole franchise thing and everything else in Singapore. And because literally, I mean, I felt like I am just too awesome. You know, the whole leadership elements that would normally go into creating a business and developing a business and getting people engaged and all that stuff went out the window because mm. I knew everything, right? Because I was too awesome. And, um, and so, uh, literally, I mean, I, you know, we, we ended up losing, I, I got these accounts because I was pretty good at the sales side and everything else. And, and then we'd lose them because I wasn't a good leader. And then, you know, eventually within a year and a half, not only um, was, you know, the, the business closed, but I was a half a million dollars in debt, okay? which you know, as you can imagine, is really no fun. So, no, no, so I, I had to go and <laughs> you know, I had to go and get um, a job. You know, because because sometimes you you actually need to get a job <laughs> and you have no money and you're in debt. So um, so I go into uh, so so I get this job and it's a pretty good paying job. I go in as a department head in this multinational company. Okay, but by this time I still hadn't learned that I was kind of an asshole. Um, so the uh, mm. <laughs> so I but so, but I'm a still a good salesman, so I can at least convince the guys that are making the you know the job decisions to 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 go ahead and give me the job, right? Anyway, um, 
the, uh, so I go into this company and I'm still thinking I am like the best, even though it's like, and, and of course, all the mistakes I made and all the problems I had and all the debt, of course, that wasn't my fault because I was too awesome, right? Yeah, it's always and, somebody uh, else. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So, so what ended up, ended up happening is within a, a really reasonable uh, short period of time, you know, because when you go in and you get this job, you're thinking, man, you know, I can do all, you know, you're, you can see all this excitement. You've got all this excitement about what you can do and how you can do it. And I'm going to, you know, I'll, eventually I'll be managing director of my own branch and, you know, in a different country. And I'm going to have all these different kinds of things that I could do. Right. And you, you're, you're just excited when you get this new job. And after a while, I started realizing that, you know, all these people are kind of like blaming each other. It's like, oh man, you know, I'm thinking, man, what is wrong with these people? It's not, no problem. I can do it. I can, I, you know, I know I can make a big difference. And, and so I come up with these really cool ideas and I present them to the other department heads. You know, have you ever had cool ideas, Quinn? Oh yes. Oh yeah. I, and, yeah you know, and, and so I'd present them to people, right? And they'd look at me and they'd say, look, you know, and I'd say, look, you know, and they, they say, you have your own department, okay? So you don't need you don't need our resources. We've got our own things that we're working on. I'm trying to get people to work together to do all these things and everything else. They said, look, you do your thing, we'll do our thing. And I'm thinking, man, what is wrong with these people? Four and a half months later though, I knew I could make a difference. Four and a half months later, you know what happened? You had another idea. No, no, I, 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 four and a half months later, without even realizing it, I started blaming people, okay? And then people would come to me and say, hey, Arthur, can you help me with this thing? I'd say, look, you do your thing, I'll do my thing. I got sucked into the culture. And, and you know, and the worst part is that um, I, I started to, you know, feel just kind of stuck. And I had this job and um, the, the pay was good. I mean, it was good pay, but you know, it was, it became a chore to go to work every morning. I mean, I, I just felt like, oh my gosh, I have to go to work again. You know what I mean? It was like my life was over and I was stuck in this situation. And it didn't matter about the money because any, you know, it, it, the money really didn't matter. It was the, the entire environment of me feeling that I was less than I could be. It just, just made it unbearable. And it affected my personal life. Of course, you know, I became an underachiever at work. I, I started doing a lot. You know how there's people that, you know, that they're, they're always busy, but, you know, they don't really accomplish that much. Yes. I right. became one of those people, right? I was like always busy. I was doing busy work, like about maybe uh, only 60, 70 percent of my real effort was being put towards the job. The rest of it was busy work. And, you know, and, and, and the thing is that it didn't make me feel any better. It really didn't make me feel any better. And, and one day I looked in the mirror and I thought, you suck. <laughs> and um, so I decided I was going to go and talk to these bad people, these people that are making my life difficult. And so I, I went and I, I found out something completely unexpected. I found out that they were real human beings, that they also had ideas and they had standards and they also got sucked into this culture and i'm thinking man so it's not really the people because you know sometimes it's so easy to blame people right i mean it's just so easy to just say oh it's because of them it's because my problems are because of them my problems are because i'm not getting you know the support or the money or whatever it is for my department or for my company or for whatever it's so easy to just blame other people and then I realize these people, they're, they're, all, they're, all, they're all sucked into the same culture. So it's, it's the environment that is affecting them. So I'm thinking, damn, well, if, if, this is, if the environment is affecting them, it's affecting me, so this is something bigger. And I'm thinking, all right, well, since I'm already only putting in about 60, 70% of my real effort and doing the rest busy work, I, I started using that the rest of that time to do research on why this was happening. And so I discovered things um, that were essentially uh, uh, about your genetic brain processing, how your brain gets clarity and how that affects your communication and for that matter, expectations and respect and trust and everything. 
and um, well, leads to respect and trust. And uh, also discovered, you know, the why people are motivated and, you know, in, in groups differently. For example, you know, like, I, I mean, you have friends, right, Quinn? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, not just Facebook friends, right? I mean, like real ones. Yeah, exactly. Real ones. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so you go, how is one group of friends? It's different. Your, your behavior is different with one group of friends than it is with a different group of friends, isn't it? A hundred percent. And it's... Yeah. And it's different with your family than it is with your friends. So you've got all these different environments that affect you differently. And, and why is that? So I was like, I'm trying to figure all this stuff out. And eventually, within about a year, I came up with a framework for what eventually became known as uh, the directive communication psychology. And I tried it in this company, and we ended up saving the company uh, $17,000 a week in wastage just between myself trying this with two other departments. Yeah. And uh, so you end up saving the company or the company was never in danger. It was just that. No, I mean, it's this huge, it was a huge company, but, uh, it, it, it just had a lot, it was just so dysfunctional that they just had a lot of wastage. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very big company still around, um, and it's still this multinational, but, but the thing is that, you know, just by, by making some small modifications in my behavior that affected the environment of how I was working with two other departments and how I was treating these people and kind of understanding them and, you know, based on the stuff that I had discovered, um, it literally created much more synergy, much more effectiveness and, you know, between the three departments, we ended up saving, you know, this kind of money for the company. So, no, I didn't save the company. But, um, and, and, and in fact, I didn't even really get that much credit for it from the company. But I started writing articles about it. And then I started getting on radio. And then uh, I got on TV. And then people started calling me. And uh, then, you know, within a short time after that, I was able to quit my job and, well, essentially start my path to where I am now. And how long uh, it, were you when you were in that job? Uh, did you manage to pay out your your debt from that? No, no. It's, um, that, you know that it was a, it was a lot of debt, <laughs> and uh, and no, I I was in that job for a little bit more than a year, about a, a little less than a year and a half, and um, the uh, and then when I started this job, okay, you know, I mean, it, I, was, I started to kind of get get out there and and it took me a little while to get well known um I, I built up the brand over about three years and then from that point i still wasn't in i was still not out of debt okay but uh uh then after, at, at that time i decided i needed to franchise my own methodology which is directed communication psychology so because i was still in debt and because singapore at that time which is where i was living was very expensive to do anything <laughs> Um, artwork, uh, websites, uh, all the stuff that you need to do in order to really develop a, a, a good franchise. I, um, I, I looked around and I found a place that was that where I could market it well. So instead of just selling, hey, get certified in DC psychology or directive communication psychology uh, with Arthur, you know, it was like, hey, live the lifestyle. Okay, which so I moved to Bali. I got a villa in Bali, which I rented for reasonably cheap at that time. And um, then I, uh, I, I, because of the labor costs here, it was a lot cheaper than what I could afford in Singapore. And uh, then within, I, I managed to build this whole franchise up, build up my brand. And within two years after moving to Bali, I was out of debt. Nice. That's pretty, pretty quick. And now this, your, your whole franchise, this is all uh, done remotely and online. Is that right? No, no, no. It, because uh, the, the, the franchise is still, okay, well, the, the, it's, it's the, um, the certification in DC psychology is accredited by the American Institute of Business Psychology. So there are still some, there, there's still tests and practical tests. So uh, people do come to Bali. We also have master trainers in India and uh, uh, Singapore and uh, Malaysia. And uh, uh, right now we have over 400 licensed directive communication trainers in 18 different countries, trainers, coaches, and consultants. 
400. That's, that's incredible. And I also heard that you have a, a game. You have a game that helps these uh, companies. I, I do. We, we, well, okay. So, I mean, let, I mean, let's look at what, cause, cause we never stop developing. Right. So anyway, the, the element of gamification, uh, we incorporated gamification into the, the training programs a long time ago. I mean, actually when we first started, um, but, uh, but the, the real elements of, of gamification when it's applied to work process, that's where the magic happens. I mean, people have been gamifying sales forever. Okay. Oh, here, check out the leaderboard and everything else. So these are simple versions of gamification, but how do you gamify leadership? How do you gamify cooperation? How do you game or actually interdepartmental cooperation? How do you gamify um, customer service uh, or, or, cre or innovation? So, so this game that we created literally creates a, uh, or, or say, gives people a structure to follow while they're playing a game. So they play this game for one day. And at the end of this game, they literally have a gamified work process to help them achieve uh, different things in their uh, work environment. So that basically when they go to work, they can actually have more fun being productive. And we also created an app uh, to support the game for measurement. Because one of the key things in gamification and the key things in, in making sure that, that uh, you, that uh, that people are excited is measurement, right? Uh, yeah, so performance measurement is key for so, a, com and, and a competition. Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, and 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 so measure, and and sometimes it's competing against yourself. Sometimes it's within a team competing against another team. Sometimes it's competing against you know the the literal competition, somebody else's company. Okay, but uh, but where you are and 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 what you're doing. So there's this game called Squadly, which is a a team performance and measure and performance measurement um, app, and so this uh, is squadly with an I. So um, the uh, so, so what happens is that people go in uh, or or use this app, and it's literally it's like instant. You can create a data point in less than twenty seconds, and it just uses icons and and, and awards. Um, to give constant feedback, and of course, it gives points to those, and you can see where you are, and you can see, you know, you can do uh, 360 degree, and and you can on the web dash, you can see the entire year's worth of how people have done in a graph, and so on. So you can actually do annual reviews; they're more realistic than kind of just trying to remember. Yeah. And all this is in the input for your app. Is this done manually? Yeah, yeah. It's, I, I mean, if you if you do WhatsApp, for example, you type a little thing. Okay, I mean, it's basically it's you. You know, there's how we feel about something um, is usually going to create a um, so, you know a, an impression, right? Now, my impression of what's right or what's wrong may not be so good. So sometimes you want to also have other people peer to peers. Okay give feedback to the same kind of situation. So let's say, for example, um, uh, somebody uh, went ahead and, and they came up with this really cool idea. Now, maybe whether it was implemented, maybe it wasn't implemented, but the fact is that they maybe spent their own time. So you give them an innovation award, plus on top of that, you, uh, you give them, you know, and, and you basically just click on their name and you click on the award and then you put uh, 140 characters or less of why and you attach it to a specific objective. So maybe uh, creating an innovative company, for example, could be a, a, an overall objective, not a KPI, but an overall large objective. Because all anything has to be connected to objectives, right? Yeah. So that you actually understand what people are contributing to. And so at the end of the year, you find out that, oh, you know, out of the innovation objective, you can see all of the people that really contributed, the top contributors to being an innovative company. So you can also look at, oh, okay, this person's got the most points, so you can give them some kind of an award. Or you can also send, uh, oh, I'm feeling, uh, I'm feeling um, happy, or I'm kind of feeling frustrated. You can send negative emotions as well as positive emotions related to any of these objectives. And, um, and, and you don't, you know, and it, each data point, maximum 20 seconds to do. 
So you you choose the uh, the either the uh, emoji or the, the award. You uh, add a little bit of um, text, just mini text. Uh, you choose whether you want it to be public where everybody can see it, whether that person can see it by themselves only, or whether you just want it private. Sometimes you want to you know have your like you're feeling frustrated, but you don't want to you know tell them that. For example, yeah, yeah. and so maybe just so that you see it, but it's all at least it's on your graph, so you can see what's going on in in the future when you're doing your annual reviews. And so then it uh, creates some, um, and 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 all of this, and then you attach it to the uh, to the objective, and all of this is less than twenty seconds to do it. That's fascinating. So instant gratification. Inst. I mean, you can do it instantly. It's in your mobile phone, and then you can always you know get the the, the bigger version and see everything on the on the web dashboard. So that's really interesting. You brought up the instant gratification because I know uh, that's what nowadays everybody's looking for instant gratification. That's why Amazon is doing so well with the one day, two day delivery. It's instant gratification. Uh, you, uh, is that more of a generation Z kind of thing millennial or is it everybody now? Well, I mean, okay, let me ask you a question. Let's say you send an email to somebody, okay? How long do you wait before you send an email asking them, did you get my email? <laughs> that's, that's pretty funny. Yeah, I personally, I, I don't, but I think it, but I think it. Exactly, right, right? Okay, so it's the same thing, right? Like somebody doesn't answer your WhatsApp text or something, or, you know, like maybe they're in a hospital. Oh my gosh, something must have happened to them, right? So it's the same. I mean, everybody wants instant gratification these days. Why? Because technology has created, we are in the PFB era, post-Facebook. In the BFB before Facebook, we were a little bit more patient. Yeah, absolutely. That's very true. Yeah. <laughs> the, I mean, right now, okay, look at just looking at leadership, right? Okay. Um, you know, you're thinking, hey, you know, I, I, I really feel that I should have gotten recognized for this thing that I did, but maybe my boss didn't recognize me. Hey, you know what? If he doesn't recognize me, no problem. What I do is I'm going to go on my phone and I'm going to post a picture of a kitten or something. And then like keep checking it. it's like whoa you know already 20 likes in three minutes like yeah okay i don't need my boss to get the emotional gratification i got it here in the palm of my hand yeah and that that releases that makes your brain happy and um what's it called it releases um dopamine dopamine yeah and you get yeah, it's a dopamine addiction exactly exactly i i know far too well exactly what it is <laughs> but we need we need social media uh, i don't know if it's fortunately or unfortunately to grow our businesses so uh, we all know exactly what it is I mean, whether we need it or not whether it's good or not doesn't matter i mean it's, it's just like a gun right i mean it can be you know a positive thing uh it can be a negative thing you can use it for sports you can you know use it for uh, you can use it for crimes I mean, you know, it's a tool, okay? A hammer, same thing, okay? Um, there's no, uh, there's, <clears throat> there's no um, the, uh, specific application other than what you decide is going to be, whether it's good or bad. I, absolutely. So Arthur, if I have, in, for instance, in my case, I have a physical business. If I want to, uh, create a high performance culture. How would I go about creating a high performance culture within the business? Okay, well, first of all, there's five fundamental things that you need to have in, 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 in your culture, okay? Okay, so these are what we call the five pillars, okay? And um, uh, this is, uh, these are detailed out in uh, one of my books called The Lessons from the Monkey King. Okay, so uh, this is also available on Amazon and uh, it uh, identifies how to create a high performance culture. Um, and then the, my latest book also, which literally gives you a recipe for creating high performance teams, that one's called The Architects of Extraordinary Team Culture. Okay, and yep. um, also on Amazon. 
So these are, um, okay, let, let's just go through the, the first one, which is the five pillars of uh, cultural transformation. The first one, you have to have an, what, what would be considered a um, greater purpose, okay? So something that everybody believes in. Okay. Okay, something that everybody can buy into. And it's not going to be, let's make the company money. Okay? Yeah. So, so, so one of the things that we can create is that one of the things, I mean, literally, I mean, I've asked this question in 52 countries. And uh, people from CEOs of major corporations to janitors. And it um, doesn't matter what education, what culture, where they come from, uh, what age. It's always the same kind of stuff. Okay, what, when, when we ask, what is your ideal working environment? This is what we get. Number one, teamwork. Okay, so we want, we want to do teamwork. And there's a whole bunch of studies that identify that teamwork and team play are things that actually um, uh, are, are, are the primary things that people like about their uh, jobs. Okay, those that like their jobs. Okay, so the other thing is, um, the, that people want is a supportive environment. So maybe you got the finance department or, or you got the boss or you got this and you need something. And it's like, oh, I want to be able to do this project or I want to be able to do this thing, but I, you know, people don't support me. It doesn't matter. You know, maybe it's a different department, you know, so they want a supportive environment so that they can actually achieve what they want to achieve. Okay. Yeah. Um, and third uh, is um, you have to have a, uh, you know, they, they, they want to have trust, okay? And they have to have this sense of trust, okay? Now, trust can be people trust me to do what I'm supposed to do or, pe or I can trust people to be accountable for do to do what they're supposed to do. The other one is clarity. They want to have clarity. They want to know where they're going, okay? What to do, okay? Transparency, all these different things. And the final one is fun, okay? So this is the ideal working environment. So everybody more or less wants these in one way or another. Okay. Yes. So that essentially, if you take that idea of the ideal working environment, you're pretty much guaranteed that the majority of the people in your group are going to want that. So you can create that as your greater purpose to create an organizational culture, an environment that literally is an ideal working environment. So that's something that people can literally buy into themselves. Okay. So yep. pillar number one, create the greater purpose, which we in our processes link to the ideal working environment. Okay. Number two, have a methodology that can actually help you to create this greater purpose, which is the ideal working environment. Okay. So this, um, this methodology, Okay, what we of course use is DC psychology. So it's the science of group dynamics, why people do what they do, and how you can influence that, how people react and act to each other, and how you can uh, direct those actions and reactions so that everybody actually creates success for the company in the process of achieving personal success. Okay, so yes, yes. a methodology, DC psychology or directive communication psychology. The third one is having a common language. Okay, now this is important. And common language doesn't mean, you know, whether it's English or German or um, Arabic or whatever. Okay, common language, uh, very specifically, is uh, the, the, when, say for example, in, okay, like in DC, okay, one of the things that we have is, uh, let's say, it's, you know, sometimes you accidentally say stuff, uh, or well, okay, let me, let, let, sometimes people will say stuff and it makes you feel like, oh my gosh, maybe this person doesn't respect me or they don't trust me. And all of these things create, especially if they happen over and over again, they create disengagement. Okay. Right? So yeah. you feel, oh, okay, I'm, you know, they, they don't appreciate me. They, you know, they, they're trying to take control. They've got all these different things. And so what ends up happening is that uh, eventually you check out, you start losing interest, you start losing passion, you start losing excitement, which of course creates a poor culture. Okay. Because then you, okay, these, then people start reacting to this, but in, if you have a common language and you understand why people are doing that, so you got the methodology, you understand why people do these things, 
Okay, then instead of um, it to, it, the problem is that half the time they're not aware of what they're doing. Sometimes we think it's about us, but in reality it's about them. So by saying, for example, oh dude, you need suck to me. And people go, it's like, what? Okay, and, but it, see, if you know what that means, in DC psychology, it means that you have taken away an emotional gratification and they have this whole framework of what the emotional gratifications are and how they work and why people actually do them. And then people go, oh my gosh, dude, sorry, I didn't really mean it. Okay, this is what I meant. So it's a non-confrontational language that you can use to explain stuff that people don't want to talk about. Right? So you're just like, by, by, by having this fun language, so for example, in colored brain, right? So colored brain is the way that you're, it's, it's the brain's genetic ambiguity relief process. So how your brain gets clarity. So for example, if you tell somebody is like, oh dude, you know, I'm, I'm a green brain. Remember, I'm, I'm green. So I, you know, I know you're purple. So let's see if we can uh, kind of work this out together, right? So different clarity getting processes but you don't have to go through that whole thing because you already know the language which means you can say it in like two seconds and people understand so the common language kind of consolidates predefined communication so that people understand the psychology of why and how and what's going on and can communicate to you in a non-confrontational way so that you can get back on track, work together so that there is no disengagement, okay? So that's, that's three, okay? The fourth one is the creation of a unified identity, okay? Now, in this particular case, the culture needs to be separate from the company. Okay, and the reason why is because we want the people to own the culture. So the identity creates the club, right? So it's like if you use the language that reinforces the methodology that supports the ideal working environment or the greater purpose, okay, then you're in the club. If you don't use it, and if you're not trying to actually create this greater purpose, then you're not in the club. If you're not in the club, you are the enemy. And the enemy is actually very important, okay? Because if you actually think about it, um, okay, let's just take history, for example. Uh, during the uh, reign of the Roman Empire, the Romans pretty much had a pretty good grip on all of the different Germanic tribes because the Germanic tribes were fighting against each other all the time, okay? But this one guy, Arminius, he decides, hey, let's use the Roman Empire as the common enemy to unite all of these different Germanic tribes to fight against the Roman Empire. And he did, and that was the beginning of the fall of the Roman Empire. I, I mean, later on, the German tribes killed him, but that's beside the point. <laughs> but the thing is that you, if you have a common enemy, you can unite everybody else more easily, even if they're fighting. People put aside their differences to defeat the common enemy. Now, there's two ways to kill the enemy. Number one, you make the enemy your friend. Okay, then they're not your enemy anymore. So you bring these people in, the ones that are, ah, oh, this is no good, you know, I'm not really interested. But if they can't be part of the group, then they need to be out of the company. Because they're not gonna they're not gonna support your culture. Yeah, I really like that idea of, of the enemy because I can see it true even in the army situations where the, the soldiers get attached to each other because they always have a common enemy and they just build these really strong relationships. So it uh, makes me think, is there always a need for an enemy? What if you turn that enemy into your friend? Now, do you need another one? Well, see, okay, and, and this is, um, <laughs> this is, okay, this is also detailed out in, in, in the book that I was talking about, team, uh, the uh, Architects of Extraordinary Team Culture. It takes place in ancient Egypt. So this is a kind of a cheeky, fun story version, right? Um, and uh, anyway, so 
you know, it took 23 years to build the, the first pyramid at Giza. Okay, how do you keep people motivated for 23 years? And, and, and un contrary to popular belief created by uh, popular previous uh, um, Hollywood movies, mm -hmm. okay, the pyramids were not built by slaves. Okay, the pyramids were built by Egyptians who were very motivated. They were in teams of roughly about 70 people or so. Um, and they were very, very motivated. Um, but how do you keep people motivated for 23 years building something? And, and one of the things that, that happened historically is they literally created an enemy. It's like, oh my gosh. So for example, the first one was um, the Pharaoh got sick, right? So here's Pharaoh Kofu and he's like sick and they're not even halfway done with this pyramid. It's like, oh my gosh, he's going to die before we're finished. Hmm. So the common enemy now became time. Oh, okay. Right? And, and so it's like, oh, they suddenly they, you know, they get more motivated again, everything else. Oh, but then the Pharaoh got better. And so then they started creating enemies. Ah, oh, you know, these guys in Babylon, you know, they say that uh, their, their pyramid is going to be way better than ours. Okay, so then, now they became the enemy, right? And so, you know, it's like, oh, man, this, you know, so you've got all these different things where, uh, the, you know, the southern Egyptians, because um, at that time, uh, uh, Egypt was unified, but the southern Egyptians were still separate, right? So they're like, um, they're saying, nah, you know, those, the, the, those guys in northern Egypt, they're not going to be able to do it. It's like, what? Oh, no way, man. So now, you know, again, so you've got these, you're creating these different enemies to maintain those levels of motivation. I can see it now. Now, it doesn't have to be a person. The enemy can be a thing. It's nice. correct. Yes, it can be. So you also touched on uh, a green brain and a blue brain, and I know you did. You invented a system to color the brains. Can you explain how that is and how it works? All right. Well, all right. So here's the thing. First of all, I I, I'm, I have to clarify. This is not personality, right? This is not about personality. All right. This is a very important fact. Okay, because personality by nature is extremely complicated. Okay, you, you can't put somebody into um, a box as a personality, but here's what you can identify. You can identify um, how a person gets clarity because there is literally a genetic process. Okay, just like your eye color, okay, the length of your genes, which are called gene alleles, anyway, without getting into the whole thing, um, the, it determines the amount of certain neurotransmitters that are uh, used in getting clarity, all right? Okay. So, uh, for example, uh, green brain, which is chaotic processing, they get clarity by taking action. So they actually have to start moving around and taking action and stuff and they, you know, and, and you're green brain. Okay. You're the kind of, I can see it. You know, I mean, just the way you talk to me and everything else, you know, you are a chaotic processor, which basically means that everything in your brain, well, actually nothing in your brain is connected. Right. <laughs> so in order to actually connect stuff, it's like, Oh wait, you know, it's like you take this over here, you take this, which also can make you very creative because you don't need anything to be creative with. So some people probably say, oh, dude, you're really creative, okay? Because they see it that you don't, you start with nothing and suddenly you have this idea. So green brains need a very small amount of information and they start moving on stuff, okay? And the reason that they do that is because they, in, they need to move in order to get clarity. And if you've got other people around you, sometimes you're a little bit pushy because you need their parts so that you can see their part, so that you can get clarity in your own thing, because you're kind of getting clarity as you move forward, okay? Now, that's great for a green brain, and it works very well for a green brain, but let's say, for example, you have linear processing, okay? So this is the red brain. These guys need structure to get clarity, okay? So the more structure you have, the easier it, they can connect it to get clarity on a particular thing. And if there's no structure, they're feeling a little bit frustrated, but they find ways to create structure around it. Now you can see where a, a, a green brain, chaotic processing and a linear process, when they're trying to achieve the same thing, 
their processes are totally different. The, the red brain needs to have clarity before they take action by making sure everything's structured. And the green brain can't move if there's too much structure. <laughs> right? So then they are, they, they're like, oh my gosh, you know, this guy is like jumping into stuff and they're, you know, they're not really thinking things through and everything else. And, and the green brain is like, oh my gosh, these people aren't moving. They're just like sitting there and like analyzing shit. Okay. And so therefore people are focusing on the process instead of the objective and nothing gets done. Okay. So for example, okay, just, just to give you an idea, there, there's other brain colors, but for example, the, um, uh, the, the, the green brain, chaotic processing, they make more mistakes than any other brain color, but they recover faster from their mistakes than any other brain color. In fact, sometimes they recover so fast that nobody even realizes they made a mistake. And in some cases, when they recover from their mistakes, they have an even better solution than the original one. Okay. Well, the red brain or linear process, because they're so structured and, 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 and have such clarity usually before they move, um, they make less mistakes than any other brain color. But if they do make a mistake, they take the longest to recover because it's like, oh wait, everything was so clear. Everything was there. I can, you know, so they have to go all the way back to the beginning to find out where it went wrong. So there's no better brain color. Okay. And with, you know, blue brain, which is called intuitive processing, it's kind of like, you know, a, a, an intuition. Intuition scientifically is basically more, uh, a, a, a a more imagine like a direct line to your subconscious okay you you probably heard something five years ago somebody was uh, you were buying eggplant or something at the grocery store and somebody was talking about Bitcoin and suddenly now when, when all this Bitcoin stuff comes in you just wow oh, this feels right and you end up making tons of money because uh, of intuition but in reality, it was something that you subconsciously learned five years ago. Yeah. And, and the other one would be like, the, another one is uh, relational processing. So okay, re relational processing, it's about, it's about having as much information as possible. And then you get, you, you, with, with all this information, you get options. And then once you kind of get these options, then you can more or less see which option is better. So there are different ways of, of getting clarity. So you get, you know, some need lots of details, some need not, no information or very little information and take action. And of course, there's a lot of characteristics that go, or a lot of different things that happen because of this, right? But, that, but this does not include whether you are um, security oriented or whether you're introvert or extrovert or anything. You can be... You know, if you, you can be a, a high risk taker or a low risk taker and you can still have any one of these different brain processes. In fact, the, brain, the, the amount of risk you're willing to take also determines um, how much of your brain. Pro so, for example, if you're a, a very high risk person and you're chaotic processing, that means you're willing to take all kinds of risk. I, I mean, you literally go crazy. <laughs> right. Well, if you're. Uh, a low risk person means you're not really a kind of risk. You don't like risk too much, but you still have this chaotic processing. You're going to be a little bit more, okay, hey, you know, uh, you're, you're going to take more action in your brain and kind of, you know, maybe ask people stuff and things like this just to make sure um, that you, uh, th that you don't take too much risk. So you're, you know, and the whole introvert extrovert thing is also bullshit. Sorry. Um, that, you will find that people who say they're introverts are extremely extrovert in a different group, in a certain group of people. While maybe in another group of people, they're very introverts. And people who are extrovert in some groups are very introvert in, in other groups. So it's really a matter of environment and the environments that you prefer more than anything else. Yes, I agree. I agree with that one. It's like the, uh, I believe uh, it was Einstein that said it. Uh, don't judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree. So exactly. yes. yeah. the environment will make the, the person stand out. And it's, um, you, you mentioned that uh, you think I must be the, a green brain. And it's fantastic when you said that, because I was thinking, uh, that's me. That's me. As you were talking. Yeah. 
And I, I, I bet that must be a really, really great help for you knowing to distinguish these people. Now, when you're talking to somebody or dealing with somebody, you kind of know how their brain is thinking and what they want to do next. If they want to react it or if they want to the structure by knowing this, you, you can deal better with people. You know what to expect. Is that correct? Absolutely. Well, I mean, three, three benefits. Okay. Um, that you get number one, um, the, uh, you understand that it's a genetic thing. Okay. So by, I had this woman once ask me, Arthur, you know, I've been trying to change my husband for the past 10 years. You mean he's not going to change? And <laughs> You know, it's like, well, not in this particular case. I mean, there's other things you change. Like, for example, your emotional drives, the things that motivate you, those change. Okay? Primary motivators, okay, or we, what we call emotional drives, those change as, as things happen in your life. You know, you get married, you have kids, uh, you buy a house. Um, different, different situations will create different emotional um, drives. Yeah. Okay? But when it comes to um, your colored brain, it doesn't change. And so to try to make somebody not have a chaotic process, you can't do it. I mean, well, unless you give them drugs, which does change their brain chemistry. But um, in general, uh, you can't change people, right? So the one, by understanding that you can't change this person kind of gives you the ability to accept them, which helps you to deal with people more intelligently rather than getting frustrated, okay? Um, the, the, the second thing that it benefits you from is it helps you to manage your own expectations because you know it's like looking through you know certain colored glasses, your red brain, you're looking through red colored glasses. So expecting other people to also, I mean, it's like, come on, dude, it's common sense. It's not because they're literally looking through different colored glasses. And of course, in the other one uh, where we are... Um, uh, in the final one, it's, it also helps you to set people up for success instead of failure. I mean, sometimes, you know, it's just like, this is my success process. And because I've been very successful at my success process, just do it. Do it my way and you'll be successful. Well, it doesn't work that way. And for example, in NLP, um, uh, which is called uh, a science called neuro linguistic programming, there's this thing called modeling, right? And modeling basically says, if I do everything that somebody else does and I breathe like them and act like them and do all these things, I'll be able to do what they do. Well, unfortunately, okay, th that modeling concept, while it's valid, does not take into account a genetic processing. So for example, if you want to emulate Steve Jobs, who is purple brained, okay, who needs lots of details and everything else, Okay, um, you would not succeed because his process was very, very different than yours. On the other hand, if you want to model Richard Branson, who is obviously green brain or chaotic processing like you, you would be extraordinarily successful because you're using the same process. You see things in the same way that he sees them. So where do I go to learn more about these brain colors? Because this is really fascinating. Where would people that are listening? Uh, you can go to colored, coloredbrain.com, coloredbrain.com. But, but here, here's the best part. If you have a company, okay, so there's a lot of assessments out there, right? Okay, but um, one of the key problems that, uh, that, that people face is they, you know, uh, they, they'll say, oh, this is, you know, I'm, I'm this profile and I'm this profile and everything else. They can talk to each other about the profile. But, you know, honestly, people are freaking big busy. <laughs> I mean, really, they're just busy. And, and so what happens is that, that, you know, you don't have time to, you know, kind of think about all this and remember what all this stuff means and everything is like, and then everybody has to be trained in it and everything else. It's like, you know, right now we are in the age of instant, right? I mean, everything needs to happen now. So, um, so, so what we've done is, uh, let's say for example, everybody in a team or everybody in a, in a specific company, um, what they will do is uh, they will get a code that, in, that includes everybody. So let's say, for example, you got 11 people in your team, okay? So you get a code that's good for 11 tests. And then what ends up happening is that everybody that takes that test, they're gonna be in the same 
uh, membership area. So you log in, you can see your brain color, you can see who's in your danger zone. These are the people that you are gonna have difficulty communicating with. You can see whose danger zone you're in, because they have a little skull and crossbones on, on, on their picture. And if the, the people with the skull and crossbones pictures also are in your danger zone, they're like doubly dangerous, and then you have to figure out, ah, okay, maybe now, now I understand why, you know, we've been having some issues communicating and dealing uh, with things together. So now you can sit down and actually say, hey, let's figure this out. Um, and, and, and if you, if you want to, but in this particular case, you can just click on somebody's picture. There's a little thing that says additional insights. And you can say, oh, I want to communicate better with them. You click on communication. And it'll tell you what to do based on your brain color and their brain color. And if you want to say, oh, I want to be a better leader for this person, you click on, you know, be a better leader. And it'll tell you exactly what to do. Really, and so so it's got this whole thing that literally, you know, you don't have to think about it. You can just click on it, and it's like, oh, okay, now I understand. I mean, we uh, we did um, one of the the, uh, the the things we did with Emirates hotels, right? There was this guy named Jean Francois, and he was a red brain, very linear structured guy. Okay, and uh, the um, the restaurant manager, the fine dining restaurant manager, was Karina, and she was green brain. Anyway, they didn't know any, uh, about this about each other, but the biggest thing that they had was that, um, and everybody in the hotel knew it, these were like cats and a cat and dog. I mean, they were always, always fighting. And, and the reason was that Jean-Francois would say, Corinna, would you come into my office, please? <laughs> and Corinna would come in, and Jean-Francois would say, uh, hey, Corinna, I want you to do this. Okay, and Karina's thinking, okay, and she's like ready to go, right? But hey, 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 Jean Francois, hey, 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 and and then she was, and I want you to do like this, and it must be like this, and it has to be like this, and he's giving her all of these like you know structure and how she should do it and how she should put it into this and do this kind of structure, and she's going, oh my gosh, my boss thinks I'm an idiot. Okay, why am I here? And you know, and then they get into this fight. Anyway, then Karina would go off and do her thing, and then she'd come back. And she would say, okay, boss, finished. And Jean-Francois would say, but exactly, what did you do? Come, in, come back into my office. And so then another fight. So after they learned that she was green and he was red, they, at the exact same time, she, they said, oh my gosh, that's why. And so they decided, Jean-Francois said, okay. okay um, so, so they changed the whole structure how they work together. So Jean-Francois would ask Karina to come into, my, into her office. Karina, would you come into my office, please? And he would say, Karina, I have this task for you. This is what it is. Do you have any question? And that was it, right? And then maybe she'd ask a few questions. And then later on, when Karina finished the task, she would say, okay, boss, I did this and I did it like this and I meant this and I put it like that and this is how I did it and everything. And then they literally transformed their relationship. They became like the poster kids for um, working together. This is opening my mind right now. And I can imagine people that I talk to and things that happen and I'm putting it together now, what it means and why these things happen. And I personally have a a partner in a physical business uh, who he must be the red brain. Uh, he likes, <laughs> he calls and we can be an hour on the phone to discuss uh, a task. And sometimes I tell him, listen, if you weren't on the phone this long, I would have had it done by now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We see with the green brain, it's like, come on, let's do it already. Right. I mean, like, what are you, doing man and it's like so this is like and they, see where again we back to the culture okay creating the the common language you can now you can tell your partner dude remember i'm green that's yes. it no confrontation and you get on with it yeah no i'm definitely gonna get everybody to check uh, to check the colors and find out do you have a test there that we do to find out yeah yeah got? yeah it's the uh the cbci the colored Brain communication inventory and uh, at, at the moment right now um, if you take the test you actually get by email you get another free test to invite your friend with the same code so you kind of like you know getting this but no we don't tell that to people right now we just kind of surprise them with it okay yeah I'm, I'm getting it done uh, although I already know I know I'm green I'm definitely not a purple <laughs> red yeah 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 
So before I let you go, uh, I know uh, several names of your books. I know you have 11. Do you, do you even remember the names of all of them? Yeah, of course, of course. Uh -huh. um, but, but my favorite one, my favorite one is The Architects of Extraordinary Team Culture, Five Secrets Hidden in the Ancient Pyramids. And uh, you can find it on Amazon. Um, and the, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, I, I really put a lot of research into this and it goes into how to really keep teams motivated and, and even how to, how to identify primary motivators in people so that you can mix them to literally create perfect high performing teams. I mean, we do this for companies all around the world. And uh, we go in and, and, and we oftentimes will work with their senior management and sometimes the, the, the solution to creating a high performance team is taking one person out, literally, and you get a better performing team. Um, teaching one guy with a different person, okay? And, and, and all of that information is in there and it's really, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's taken, a, I, I mean, we've worked with uh, um, companies like uh, Western Digital, okay, Emirates, Dell, um, and you know, they've, these are all companies that we studied and teams that we studied and how they work and um, how all of this kind of creates a, a matrix that is predictable. Very good. I'll put the, I put the Architects of Extraordinary Team Culture, I'll put the links to, to all your books on the show notes so everybody can check them out. And also right. the, the color, it's your coloredbrain.com, correct? Colored, colored brain. Coloredbrain.com. Okay. Colored brain. Yeah. I'm going to put that one on the show notes. I'm going to make sure I check it and my teammates will check it as well. And for the people that are listening to us, if they want to find you, I know you're also a speaker, a TEDx speaker. I heard your TEDx talk. It was uh, fantastic. Congratulations, by the way. And for the people that Thank want you. to hire you for, uh, for speaking gigs, if they want your services, where do they find you? Well, the, uh, I mean, you can go to karmazi.net. Okay. That's uh, C A R M A Z Z I sorry in America, Z Z I. Uh, net. And uh, I guess you, you're in Bali right now? Yeah, yeah, I'm in Bali right now. I, I mean, uh, this is uh, the studio where I do all of my, uh, all of my shows. Very good. And I, I'm guessing it's Z, Z there too? Uh, you know, I, I, I've been living in so many different countries, I just kind of picked up on it. Because, you know, I, I, all the, most of the countries I lived in had, um, had uh, British influence at one point. Oh, okay, yeah, in Canada, that's where I am right now. So it, it is Z, although I say Z because I, I learned oh, my okay. English. I learned my English in Europe in school, so I say Z. It's, you know, the American. Yeah, 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 either one, Z, Z, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and about a uh, favorite book of yours, of course, uh, like we know you have 11. What is, besides the architects of extraordinary team culture, uh, another one? a book that you would recommend? Uh, you know, I mean, especially if you're looking at developing culture in an organization, um, I would definitely recommend Lessons from the Monkey King, okay, which is, uh, the, it's, it's basically, it's a culture book uh, on how to develop an organizational culture um, within an organization or a team. Awesome. So, And it I has a case study. It actually has the Emirates case study in there. Very good. Arthur, I'm going to put on the show notes uh, information for your LinkedIn profile, for your um, karmazi.net, your, your uh, books. Is there anything else you want to share with the audience? Well, I, yeah, just, you know, everything that we've done and, you know, all of the people that, I, I mean, even my own background and everything else, um, all of this, uh, my, my, my legacy project right now um, is the leadership school, you know, because there's a lot of, you know, when I, when, when I was misunderstood as a child, um, I, uh, you know, I, I got horrible grades, I couldn't spell, I, I've written 11 books, I, I still can't spell, okay, but, but the thing is that, you know, all the school system did is it didn't really support my success at the time, um, 
and and it's still not from everything that I see. Even when my you know own kids are going to elementary school, the uh, and even the, you know the the there are kids who are getting C's and and even less um, who maybe are not really great at some things, um, but they are literally conceptual geniuses. And what we've done is we've created the Kingsley Leadership Academy. It's a leadership school. It's a high school, and it's a boarding school in Malaysia. Um, and you know, uh, myself, uh, Marshall Goldsmith, uh, uh, Barry Go, who's this billionaire developer who's actually built a school. Um, I mean, this is uh, uh, this this school is literally designed to develop leaders and entrepreneurs. Um, and, and develop people's natural talents and give them the confidence and, and the competence to do it. Uh, things that the ordinary schools do not do and things that the ordinary schools even overlook uh, because they're focusing on academics only. Now, not to say that we don't focus on academics, um, it's just that the reason that a lot of people have problems taking tests and doing all this stuff is because the study processes and the test processes are not in line with their brain process. So what we do is literally, instead of having one, um, uh, like you know, one subject and one subject, we combine all the subjects, and you know, they have projects where they apply stuff so that there's actual practical outcomes for everything they're learning, whether it's history or math, and it's all combined in science. And then at the end of each year. Every student will be a published author because they will take this stuff and they're going to turn it into a story, okay, and publish it and put it into a book, which they then, again, re, uh, edit, okay, with their team and everything. Anyway, there's, a, there's this whole big stru um, structure around it. If anybody wants to find out about literally a completely revolutionary um, school process or school system and school method um, where kids – that are not necessarily the super academic guys where they can excel and, and thrive and, and, and really be successful before they even graduate, um, you can go to kingsleyleadership.academy. Arthur, is this the teacherless school? Did Sorry, could you, could you repeat that? Yeah, uh, is this the teacherless school? This is a, uh, uh, one more time, sorry, you're kind of breaking up. Yeah, sorry, is this the teacherless school? Is there a school without teachers? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, so in this case, um, yeah, the, uh, there's no teachers. Um, we have redefined um, the role of the teachers to be coaches. So the teachers don't teach, they're not in classrooms, um, they have what we call wisdom, Wisdom teams and each wisdom team is part of a hive and the hive is based on certain types of values that students already have um, so that they kind of their projects are in line with each other so that they stay motivated mm -hmm. but the wisdom teams are diverse enough so that they have some differences and the, the, the teachers instead of teaching they coach the students to teach each other Wow Wow yeah, very revo revolutionary. So the Kingsley Leadership Academy. I'll make sure to add that. Right, to Kingsley Leadership Academy. I'll add it to the show notes as well. Great. Thank you so much. Arthur, thank you for your time. Thank you for the – it's fantastic. I still have a ton of questions. Uh, maybe we should bring you to the show another time. Uh, I really want to thank you so much for being here. and. Um, all the best. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Quinn. It was great being here. Awesome. Have a great one.